Hey everybody, welcome back to Hail State Debate. Uh, it is April. April is an important month in debate. Some of you have state championships, some of you have still some national qualifiers to things like NSDA. And of course there is the TOC for those of you lucky enough to be there. And for this important month of April, we have what I think is kind of a deceptively tricky resolution. One that seems like it's straightforward, but may not be quite as straightforward as we think. And that is resolved, the United Nations should grant India permanent membership on the Security Council. Um, as always, we want this to be helpful, so if it is, maybe give us a like, maybe consider subscribing, maybe tell a friend. Uh, if you have questions, please drop them in the comments below. I have to apologize, this last month we've been a little slow in getting back to some questions because we've had a ton of stuff of our own. Uh, we've had our own nationals to get ready for, we've had uh, our own tournament that we hosted, and just a bunch of other things, but we'll hopefully get right back on the horse this month. And also remember, we are on Twitter with just sort of our occasional thoughts and uh, questions and answers and things like that, and that will be picking up as well, so maybe follow us there. Um, but without further ado, uh, my thoughts on the resolution are that I am not crazy about it. Uh, I don't hate it, but I also don't love it. Uh, I think that it has the potential to get bogged down in some framing questions and some theory questions uh, and some is this a plan type questions uh, that I don't know that the, um, the topic committee intended. But I don't know any way you can really debate something that's about diplomacy and sort of trading influence back and forth without talking about how it's actually going to happen. And I think that's where this sort of ambiguity comes in, which is the, the big question of how does India get its membership, its permanent membership on the Security Council? You know, for example, does it just go in alone? Do we just have a, a two-thirds vote of the General Assembly that's required to amend the UN Charter and we put India in and nobody else? That's possible, but that's not something that a lot of real-world experts are saying is is a is a proposal that folks are thinking about, right? Does it go in as a package deal with other members of the group, the G4, right? The Germany, India, Japan, and Brazil. That seems much more plausible. That's what this group has been pushing for. That's something that's discussed in the real world. Does it go in with another group? And if it does go in with one of these groups, do we also add more like non-permanent members in addition to however many permanent members? Because that's a part of this sort of larger issue of UN Security Council reform. Because when when we talk in the real world about what we're going to do, it usually is about some kind of package deal of a larger reform of the UN Security Council, not let's take one member of the UN like India and put them in, right? And, and then in addition to those questions of how many people get in, there's also what do they get when they get there, right? So uh, does India join and get like full veto power, the ability to veto anything that the Security Council does, which the current uh, P5, the sort of uh, the, the five permanent members get, um, it, it, we could do it that way. But in addition, there are real world proposals, including, you know, suggestions from the G4 itself uh, that perhaps these members could come in without veto power or at least some delay to them actually having the veto power. And that's really important because so many of the impacts that you're going to see uh, from this debate deal with the use of the veto power. The veto power is the ability to completely shut down the Security Council's action on anything anywhere in the world unilaterally that's an awesome incredible power and the question of whether you have to advocate for that as the pro or whether alternatively we could have a world in which maybe you're a permanent member and you don't come off uh, the council but you don't necessarily have the veto that's an interesting question it's a question that that begs the other question which is would that be a plan so anyway, I guess what I'm saying is unlike pharmaceuticals or housing where the goal was pretty straightforward, this resolution requires you to be pretty thoughtful in terms of framing, in terms of explaining what the goals are, in terms of explaining what the objective is. Uh, these issues may not come up in every round, but I do think you need to have a sort of logical, thoughtful process of exactly how you're going to advocate for India getting in and how you're going to oppose that in case it does happen. I, I don't know that this ambiguity was intended by the topic committee. I don't think it was, but I do think it's something that all the teams that are debating this really do need to think about. On the plus side, I will say I think the topic is pretty balanced. Uh, I think there's good ground on both sides, both specific arguments and general arguments. It's also a topic that rewards depth of knowledge. Uh, in just a minute, we're going to talk about some historical context about the UN and the Security Council. And I think it's really important on a topic where you can't just directly run to, you know, X number of lives lost, X number of jobs lost, X number of dollars lost, to be able to explain the historical context of like what these institutions are supposed to do. If you are able to persuasively explain, look, 
Here's what the Security Council's job is, right? It's not just some representative body. It has a specific job. And here's why India is going to make it better or worse at that job. I think you're going to have a real advantage in this debate, especially because, you know, permanent membership on the Security Council is just what it says. It's permanent, right? So the, 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 the long-term impact that India would have on the ability of the Security Council to function, its legitimacy, its decisiveness, whatever you want to say, is, is arguably going to outweigh any particular conflict that might exist in the world today, right? Um, you know, there are some general principles we can discern that are likely to come up. You know, the idea that more countries arguably means more vetoes, which means that the UN Security Council is less able to intervene. And on the other hand, you might say more countries equals better representation, which equals more legitimacy. But it's very difficult to figure out exactly how these things are going to play out in practice, which is why it's important to understand these fundamental principles of what is the job of the Security Council? Historically, what is it supposed to do? How does it function? And will India, in general, overall, make it better at that job or worse at that job? So anyway, those are my preliminary thoughts. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to start with some historical context and really take a little bit of time on that because I think that's going to be a major advantage for teams that understand it. And then we'll talk about framing and definitions, then pro arguments, then con arguments, and we will wrap up. So without further ado, let's talk about some history right now. Okay, so let's get started with some history uh, 101 about the UN and the Security Council. Why are we starting with history? Two reasons. First of all, generally speaking, history is a very powerful tool in public forum and in debate in general. Uh, people who can put things in context and summon comparisons and anecdotes have a big advantage over people who only know this particular topic. But the more important reason for this particular topic is that the standard that we're using to evaluate the resolution is not self-evident. It's not immediately obvious to any uh, listener or viewer of the debate. And we need history to help explain what the standard ought to be for whether a country should be a permanent member of the Security Council, right? With the pharmaceutical re uh, resolution a few months back, it was pretty obvious what we were trying to do, right? We were trying to get life-saving drugs to more people at a reasonable cost. And the question was, how do we do that? Same thing with housing. We want people to have housing. We want it to be affordable. You know, we want Want it to, to, to be more of it, get rid of shortages. How do we do that, right? Pretty obvious. Don't really have to explain that to the judge. But with the Security Council, it's not readily apparent to any judge that just happens to wander in the door of the tournament exactly what this thing is, why it exists, why historically we've had it, and what function it's supposed to play. Same thing with the veto. What's the point of the veto? It's such an odd thing to let one country sort of say no to the collective will of potentially on another 190 countries. Why? Why do we do that? And it's not immediately obvious. It's certainly not immediately obvious to judges. So teams that take the time to understand this history and context and potentially even to explain it in the round to the judge are going to have a big, big advantage, I think. And so let's start with sort of part one of the history. And this will take a little while, but please bear with me. I think it's worth it. Um, why does the Security Council exist in the first place? And to understand that and to understand the UN in general, we actually need to go back in time to 25 years before the UN was established, back to 1920 with the establishment of the League of Nations. Now, the League of Nations was basically the precursor to the UN. It was established after World War I, basically with the idea we're going to prevent this similar catastrophic war uh, from ever happening again, right? Now, obviously, given the fact that we had a World War II, uh, which led to the founding of the UN in 1945, we pretty clearly failed at that task with the League of Nations. In fact, uh, the story of how World War II happened is in many respects the story of how the League of Nations failed, right? And so understanding what happens when international diplomatic bodies fail is really important to a debate today about how we should potentially change and modify our current international diplomatic body and what might happen if we don't, right? Because those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So, uh, you know, we're going to drop a link uh, to an article in the notes below kind of explaining the history of the League of Nations. I hope you'll read it. It's not too long. There are plenty more to read, but the super, super abbreviated version of why the League of Nations failed is this. The League of Nations failed because it was pretending to be this organization that had this really strong global consensus uh, 
but it actually didn't, right? Britain and France, the winners of World War I, were really running the show. Uh, and so when uh, other countries that were members of the League, like Japan and Italy, started invading other countries in the 1930s, the League didn't really have a strong consensus. It didn't really have the ability to sort of marshal the other countries to come around and say, no, Japan, no, Italy, you have to stop. All it could really do was pass some kind of angry resolutions and impose some trade sanctions. And then when Hitler came to power in Germany and he started attacking the Versailles Treaty, which the League of Nations was sort of rooted in, same thing, right? The League couldn't do anything. It was powerless. It was just kind of like a puppet organization for a handful of powers that, that you know, didn't by themselves have the ability to do anything. And all three of these countries, Japan, Germany, and Italy, saw that, you know, this was not an organization that represented their interests. It was pretty much powerless to stop them. And so they said, what are we doing here? They left, right? They left the League of Nations, which exposed it as being not really a sort of truly representative, like, global body, but really more just sort of like a club for the winners of World War I, right? And surprise, these three uh, countries, after they walked out, they formed their own loose alliance, the Axis powers, and the rest is, you know, tragic, bloody history. Uh, and in a lot of ways, World War II, you know, which led to the establishment of the UN, is a lesson about the consequences when these international diplomatic organizations fail and why they fail, right? And they fail when they don't really reflect a true international consensus, when the members feel like they're not being appropriately served, right, for, for whatever reason, when they're not viewed as truly legitimate and representative, and when they can't summon the will to take action against bad actors on the international stage, right? And so you can sort of already see some shades of what we're going to be talking about in a few minutes with India about like representation and legitimacy and right one strong narrative for the pro although both sides can use this I think if they're smart is look we have to learn from the failures of the past and ensure that the UN is viewed as legitimate in the world that exists today as opposed to this world that existed 75 years ago back in the 1940s. It has to be something that countries around the world view as legitimate because it's a diplomatic organization. The only real resource it has is its legitimacy, right? But let's hold off on that for a minute. And let's just keep going with the historical story. So now we fast forward to San Francisco in June of 1945 when the UN Charter is formally approved. And the basic idea of the UN, the core function to the UN is to talk, right? It's to have a body where countries can come together and their disagreements can be resolved by talking and negotiating and discussions rather than fighting, rather than World War II or anything like it. The idea was, the core of it was we never want to have anything like World War II ever happen again, right? Fair enough. It's a deliberative body where we go and talk, right? But in the years leading up to 1945, Roosevelt, Churchill, and the Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov had already been talking about, okay, but exactly how is this organization going to work? And in addition to just getting together and talking and having these sort of resolutions that are effectively non-binding, what's the enforcement capacity going to be? Like, how are we going to balance the idea that we don't want to lock ourselves into like a, a, a world government, which nobody wanted to do, but we also want to have some ability to enforce this desire for peace, right? And FDR consistently put forward this idea that you need, yes, a general body to discuss and debate the issues, to have resolutions and stuff, that's the General Assembly, but you also need something that he called the four policemen, right? And this is sort of a famous term, uh, the US, the UK, France, and Russia, which was then the Soviet Union. And and they need to have collective responsibility for being sort of the big brothers to the rest of the world to prevent conflict, right? And in 1944, this idea of the four policemen was formalized in a U.S. State Department proposal to have a U.N. Security Council consisting of the big four, which would turn out to be the big five when China was added prior to the adoption of the charter. And each one of these members would sort of collectively with one another have the responsibility for stepping in and stopping conflicts before they got too big, from stopping the next Germany, the next Italy, the next Japan. And most importantly, they all five would have a veto. And the idea behind the veto is we don't want this organization to shake itself apart because one or two of these big powerful members feel like they're getting dragged along into things that they don't want to do. Right? We don't want it to be like, you know, sort of, for example, Italy or Germany feeling like they're getting dragged along by this weak League of Nations being forced to assent or at least put up with things that they don't like. 
So for these big sort of VIP members, the ones that we're going to turn to, to really preserve security when things start getting bad, we're going to give them a veto to make sure that they don't have to do anything that they don't feel comfortable doing. And in many ways, this is sort of a, a concession to reality. So the idea behind the Security Council is basically the policing arm of the UN as opposed to the General Assembly, which is the representative body. And these are supposed to be the major powers that we could count on to stop the next Germany, the next Italy, the next Japan from throwing the world into chaos. Right. And the idea was that the veto was to make sure that they only acted when they were all comfortable with it, because that fracturing when these powers couldn't get along and felt like the League of Nations didn't represent them was part of the downfall of the League of Nations. So, right. So why do this? Right. Why have some members have greater influence than others and particularly the greater ability to say no. Right. And the answer to that is because the framers or the founders of the UN, the framers of the UN Charter understood that the UN is not a democracy. Right. It's a loose alliance. It can come apart at any time. Right. In a democracy, you can say to powerful individuals, the rich, the influential, the Bill Gates and the Jeff Bezos look, you know, the majority voted uh, and they want to tax you more. They want to regulate you more or whatever. And that's just how it's going to have to be. You're going to have to go along with it. But the U.N. is not a democracy. It's a loose confederation of sovereign countries that have radically different interests and can, historically speaking, if we look at prior organizations, leave. Right. And the only real influence that the U.N. has is from the power that its member countries can exert on its behalf. It's military, their military power, right, their economic power. The UN has, you know, a relative handful of peacekeepers that can go in and keep the peace when there's a conflict that has stopped. But even they have to be given to it or donated to it by member countries. It has no standing army of its own. It has no significant economic power of its own, right? And so the framers of the UN Charter knew from hard experience with the League of Nations that if these major powers thought they were getting a raw deal, they would just walk away, right? And this is not just a hypothetical. This is not something that only happens in, in, in ancient history or, or in, you know, imaginary debate scenarios. Uh, countries walk away from diplomatic organizations all the time. Look last year to 2018 when the United States decided to quit the UN, uh, UN Human Rights Council because of a perceived bias against Israel and because of the tolerance for states that the U.S. views as human rights violators. Now, that isn't nearly the same thing as quitting the U.N. entirely, but it's quit, pr it's quitting a pretty important organ of the U.N., a body within the U.N., and it shows how countries that feel like they don't have anything to gain can just take their ball and go home, and that's something we want to avoid. So the important point here is that the veto is in many ways a necessary evil, right? The U.N. is supposed to be this body where the world comes together and reaches consensus through d deliberation, but the veto says... Powerful interests can trump that. You know, the veto is a concession to practical politics over principle. In a perfect world, no one country would be able to stop the consensus of the vast majority of the UN, right? But in the real world, we just can't risk having the UN or China or Russia walk away and start up their own faction because that's how world wars get started. Okay, so now some modern history, right? The, the current structure of the Security Council and the proposals to reform or change it. Um, Briefly, uh, just to recap what you probably already know from your research, the Security Council is a 15-member organ of the UN, one of the major bodies of the UN, separate and apart from the General Assembly and all of the other units. Uh, it has five permanent members, the US, the UK, France, Russia, and China, and 10 other members that are rotating and are elected from various regions to serve two-year terms. Now, the job of the Security Council is not to be a representative body. It's not to debate things like climate change or to debate things like, uh, you know, just sort of general economic growth or things like that, unless they are directly related to security, because its job is to maintain global peace and security to the best of its ability. And to do that, the UN Charter gives it certain abilities and certain things that it can do. So, for example, it can issue resolutions calling for parties to a global conflict or a war to resolve the conflict. Hey, you guys, quit it, right? You, you need to stop now. The UN is condemning this conflict. You need to stop it. It can authorize peacekeeping missions using UN peacekeeping troops. These are the troops with the blue helmets, right, that you see that are actually under UN command, not under the command of any particular country. They can only be used in a non-offensive capacity. Capacity. They can only go into a region to stabilize it, hold it steady. They cannot invade. They cannot take territory. They can only sort of preserve the status quo. Uh, but the UN doesn't have its own troops. These troops have to be provided by the member states. There is no standing UN army. It cannot go out and hire or conscript its own troops. They have to be provided. And incidentally, India is one of the largest providers of troops, if not the largest. It's certainly a bigger provider of peacekeeping troops than any current member of the P5. 
Uh, the sort of most aggressive thing that the Security Council can do is it actually can call for military action against an aggressor, uh, which is something that you know it has done in numerous instances in the past. Uh, and the idea is you call upon member states to go and take action against an aggressor country uh, in order to stop the aggression. But again, these are not peacekeeping forces. These are the actual military forces of the member countries. And the member countries have to voluntarily decide to participate. So here again, the legitimacy of the Security Council and its ability to sort of marshal the confidence and the belief of these countries to come in and, and support it is critical, right? Uh, in theory... Um, the, Uni in, in, uh, the, the Security Council, in theory, must uh, authorize any member country's use of force except in self-defense. This is a purely theoretical thing. In other words, the UN would theoretically have to vote before the United States could have gone to war in Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, in reality, this, this rule is, is not honored. It is, it's simply not applied. So that's a theoretical thing that doesn't really work in practice. It can also call for economic sanctions. But again, just like with military action, the states themselves that make up the UN have to carry that out. And uh, it also has some administrative powers within uh, the UN. For example, it, it recommends the new Secretary General for a vote to the uh, General Assembly. So we can see that the main goal here is to sort of make decisions about where the members of the UN should direct their force, either their military force, right, their diplomatic force, or their economic force in terms of uh, in terms of sanctions to stop global conflicts, right? Um, and if you're going to have that be your job, if your job is to say, we're going to make you stop doing what you're doing, you're going to want to have some heavy hitters on the Security Council. Because, for example, you know, if you just had a random selection of UN members making up this council, if you just like chose the names out of a hat, right, and you had 15 small developing countries and like, you know, Burundi, Finland, and Uruguay all got together and said, hey, let's go and let's go and stop the aggression by country X, you know, here's our 35 troops apiece, U.S., China, Russia, go get them, you know? Well, <laughs> U.S., China, and Russia are going to be looking at each other like, who are these people to tell us, you know, they got like, they're, they're committing like 35 troops, you know, uh, who are they to tell us that we've got to go fight a war or impose economic sanctions? So you can sort of see how that would be a problem. It would be viewed as illegitimate. Uh, the, so the countries that are going to be asked to shoulder the burden, right, of a military action or of a, an economic uh, sanction effort, right, they're going to be, need to be the ones who are driving the ship, right? Otherwise, it becomes illegitimate and and, you know, the, the members don't participate, they don't go along with the sanctions, they don't go along with the military action, and it's viewed as kind of a joke, right? They don't commit the peacekeeping troops, and it's viewed as a joke, right? Now, to act, the, the Security Council requires a supermajority of nine votes, and as we said earlier, most importantly, uh, the P5, the permanent five members, uh, have a unilateral veto. They can single-handedly shut down anything that the UN is, uh, the Security Council is considering doing. So, like we said earlier, the, these permanent members are basically the sort of the winners of World War II, and the composition of the Security Council has not changed since the UN was established in 1945. Um, but for a couple of decades now, there has been this consistent push by some countries to expand and also possibly to reform the Security Council to reflect the fact that the balance of power in the world today, in 2019, or you know, in the last couple of decades, is very different than it was when these five elite powers were chosen in 1945. And the main group of states pushing for entry in the P5 is called the G4. And this is Brazil, Germany, India, and Japan, as we said earlier. And all four of these groups, they sort of are, are together as an alliance. They each support each other's candidacies, and they have since really the early 2000s. And look, their basic argument is simple. Look, since 1945, uh, we four countries have grown into world powers that are comparable to at least some of the members of the P5 in terms of our GDP, in terms of our population, our military size, our spending. Uh, and so if the idea is that the veto and this this elite status as a permanent member is something that we want to give to countries that where we don't want to make a move without them, right? But they're major players, so we don't want to make a move without them. Well, we're major players, right? We, Brazil, Germany, India, and Japan, we're major players. We may not be on par with the U.S., or China, but hey, who is, right? Nobody is, that's really it. But but we are definitely on par with the UK, with France, with Russia, uh, in terms of our population, GDP, military spending. We're certainly on par with those three. And India in particular says, and would say, and does say, look, our GDP is bigger than the United Kingdom's or France's. It's about twice the size of Russia. Now, granted, our per capita GDP is low because we have about a billion people, but that's really not what you should be concerned about, UN. 
because in terms of our international clout, what you're worried about is is how much damage our sanctions would do to a country. And so it doesn't matter what our per capita GDP is. It's the overall GDP. And our $3.1 trillion GDP is a lot of weight that we can help you throw around, right? Our military spending is right on par with Russia. It's ahead of the UK. It's ahead of France. We're a nuclear power. We're the only member of the G4 that's a nuclear power. We actually provide far more UN peacekeeping troops than any other current P5 member. We are carrying our weight. We are a serious economic power. We are the world's largest democracy. We're a serious military power. So if the point of the veto and this permanent membership status is that the UN shouldn't make decisions unless all the major players are in agreement, well, newsflash, in 2019, we are a major player right? We're just as major as three of these members here. These three folks here, we're easily the equal of all of them in any way that matters. And of course, Japan, Brazil, and Germany make similar arguments, but we'll hold off on that for now. Now, on its face, this is a pretty compelling argument, right? The, the problem is, and this is kind of where the negative starts to look at its ground, it's like, but there are other countries who turn and look at that and they say, wait a minute, it's not just you, India. It's not even just your little group of four. There are a lot of countries in this global second tier that have similar economic and military power that can make similar cases for getting in. We can't all get in because then we'd have like, you know, 25 vetoes, right? So why should we let you in India in and why should we, or, or even you're a little group of four why should we let you in in front of everybody else right and it, as it turns out those peer countries are the ones that are leading the charge against the G4 right and India uh, in their case to join the Security Council permanently and they have a group too and it's called uniting for consensus which I will refer to uh, for short as UFC it is not exactly the same thing as UFC uh, in the in the combat sense although sometimes it feels that way given how contentious it is and it has members like Italy, South Korea, Canada, Spain, Mexico, Turkey, Argentina, and no surprise, India's bitter geopolitical rival, Pakistan. And they sort of laid out their manifesto in a 2005 draft proposal to the General Assembly, which we will link to. And their basic argument, right, goes like this. It's, it's look, look, it's not a question of whether India or Germany or Japan or whoever is an influential, powerful country, right? We can stipulate they are all very influential and so are we, right? It's not a question of whether they deserve to be permanent members. It's a question about uh, whether or not we should be expanding this institution of the Security Council at all, or at least expanding it on a very limited basis. Um, expanding the Security Council as a general matter is is bad on its face, right? Permanent members who don't have to be reelected, they're on forever, and they can veto Security Council resolutions, make the Security Council less accountable to the membership as a whole, right? And that's a serious problem. And adding one or two or even, you know, five countries to that club is not going to make anything better. It's going to make it worse. It's going to take this unaccountable, unreviewable, unoverturnable veto that lets us stop the UN from doing anything. And it's going to hand it to just a handful more countries and sort of raise them to this privileged status while the vast majority of us still stay on the outside looking in, right? This will not alleviate division within the UN, they say. It will make it worse. Because right now, you know, if the comparator, if the standard is, look, you've got to be on par with the U.S., China, Russia, France, and Britain, you know, there are, there are only a relative handful of countries that, that do that, right? But if we let India in, then every country out there that's comparable to India will suddenly be like, you know, wow, we're at least as good as India. Our per capita GDP is much, much higher. Our military spending is comparable, right? If you let India in or any of the G4 or all of the G4, you're going to go from having, you know, three or four countries agitating for membership to, you know, potentially a dozen. They're going to, they're going to look at this and say, well, we're, you know, we're Spain. We're, you know, uh, we're Canada. We're all these other countries. Why aren't we in? Where is the line, right? And you can't let them all in. You certainly can't let them because for one thing, if it gets too big, it stops being a security council and it's just like a, you know, half the General Assembly. But more importantly, if you give more and more countries the veto power, eventually you just paralyze the UN, right? If if the Security Council was truly representative of all the countries in the world, then on almost anything, you'd have somebody who'd be willing to exercise the veto and the Security Council would be would be effectively paralyzed, right? And so what they're saying is, look, Let's be real here. Power is a zero-sum game. There is a set finite amount of influence over UN decisions and a set finite amount 
of international relations power generally. And the more power you have, the less power I have. If India becomes more influential, then its military rival Pakistan becomes less influential. So that is sort of our historical background to bring us up to the current present day. Now let's talk about framing the resolution. Okay, so let's talk about some definitions and framework. And I think the main issue on this resolution is gonna be more about framework. There's only maybe one issue that I would see as sort of a definition. So let's just run through them uh, as quickly as we can. They're a little bit involved. The first thing, and I think it's pretty straightforward, is that the United Nations is the actor. The resolution specifies an actor, and this is pretty straightforward. You know, I I've seen some folks talking about sort of the, the procedural difficulty of getting 129 votes and all these things about how it's implausible. But the whole reason we have fiat in debate, right? The whole reason we have the idea that the judge makes the decision is because it's not a debate about what will happen it's a debate about what ought to happen so i don't really think those arguments hold a lot of water the idea is judge whatever difficulties exist in the real world you have the ability to cut the gordian knot you cast your ballot and india gets in so i think that is a very uh, i think a good thing is sort of merciful for us to have you know a, a clear actor unlike some resolutions the much bigger and more complex question uh that we're going to talk about for for a little while is the question of exactly how india is is going to get on as a permanent member of the Security Council. Uh, what will the arrangement be? And you remember how I told you earlier that I thought that there were some complicated issues in the framing of this topic and the logistics of this topic that I, I didn't know whether the topic committee intended them. Well, this is that part, and we're going to talk about them. And look, you might get lucky, and you might have a bunch of rounds where nobody wants to talk about this at all, and that's great, because you'll be focusing on issues, which is what PF is supposed to be about. But you need to be aware of the complexity here and kind of have a roadmap and a plan about how you're going to deal with it, because if it does come up and it catches you off guard, you could find yourself almost ruled out of the round based on a framework and not be aware of, of like that it was coming and not have been ready to, to address it. So how exactly would India get on the Security Council as a permanent member? Well, let's start with the simplest possible framing, right? The simplest possible framing from the pro would be to say that India gets on as a permanent member Everything else stays the same. The veto stays the same. They get the veto because all permanent members have the veto of Security Council actions, and that's it. Now, this is clearly topical, right? It's obviously exactly what the resolution says. Uh, it's clearly not a plan, but, and it doesn't violate the rules of PF because it's just literally a, a very a very literal implementation of what the resolution actually says. So that's not that certainly can't be an, an impermissible plan. But there's a couple of problems with it, okay? The first problem is there's literally nobody in the world who's talking about doing exactly this. Like this idea of let's put India on and only India and nothing else changes. If you look at all the competing groups involved in the Security Council reform debate, the G4, the, the, the UFC, the L69, which is a group of developing nations, the African group, all of these different groups, literally nobody is talking about letting exactly one country in uh, and certainly not just India, right? Um, and so as you can see here, we have this very succinct summary of like all of these different positions and proposals. This is from 2015, but it is the most recent kind of comprehensive proposal that I could find. Um, and as you can see, it's kind of like a battle royale of all these different proposals on how to reform the Security Council. The G4 wants all of its members in. The UFC wants no permanent new seats, but a larger non-permanent body of seats. The African group wants uh, two uh, seats for Africa and so on. Uh, the Kofi Annan reform group back in 2005 wants six new seats. But nobody, including India, right? And that's important, including India itself, nobody is saying, let's let India in and nobody else, right? And the reason for that is this is diplomacy, right? The UN is nothing but a big diplomacy club. Everybody's jockeying for their own interests, but to get your own interests, you have to make alliances in order to obtain them. So, right, the whole point of United Nations Security Council reform in general is to build better consensus and stronger legitimacy. And we're going to talk about legitimacy later and why it is sort of the currency the UN trades in and why it's so important. Um, and moving India in alone would make the legitimacy of the Security Council worse. And let me explain why I think that's the case. It's because while there is a general discontent now about the Security Council, there are people who are griping and saying we need to get in, you know, imagine if you said, okay, okay, look, UN members, we know we have a problem, okay? Everybody just listen up. We know we have a problem. We know that you are unhappy about the composition of the Security Council. And they're kind of grumbling and looking around and they start listening. It's like, we hear what you're saying and we want to do something to fix it. And everybody's like, okay, yeah, all right, good. Yeah, we want to fix the Security Council. What are we going to do? And they say, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to let India in and nobody else and all you other losers can go home. Well, they would be howling for blood, right? Uh, the other members of the G4 would be like, hey, I thought we were a team here. I thought we were all going to go in together. 
What 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 happened? Right? Uh, the the African uh, group would be irate. Uh, many other groups would say, "Well, look, you've you've raised one person up to this elevated status, and we're all stuck out here, and so now we've done the reform, and and we're all sort of stuck where we were. It wouldn't make anything better, right? And everybody knows that." Right? All of these countries that are jockeying for, for position know that that's the case, which is why none of them are foolish enough to say, let us in and nobody else, including India, right? So if that's not a realistic option, if that's not going to happen, can pro teams do something else? I mean, clearly pro teams can do that under the rules of PF, but it would be, I think, kind of a foolish approach uh, because... Um, of, of all the disadvantages of basically making every other country in the UN mad? Or, or can pro teams pick something else that is a more realistic option? Could they, for example, come in and advocate for the G4 to get in as a whole? Or could they use the 2005 proposal from the Kofi Annan panel to have six new permanent members? And I think the short answer is yes. As a pro team, you can use those things. Uh, you can advance these real world proposals. But to understand why and to understand the logistics of it, and this is, again, this is where it sort of starts to get a little complex. Um, let's look at what the objections might be to doing that. Well, the main objection to picking any one of these proposals and using it is, you know, you guys say it with me, it's a plan, right? But remember that the PF rules bar plans and counter plans, but they specifically say you can have practical solutions. And that term in the rules has to mean something. It can't just be superfluous. We can't interpret words in our rules as being superfluous. And I think one of the things you can do is you can have a little bit of evidence ready to go just in your back pocket and say, look, this G4 proposal or this Kofi Annan group proposal or this African group proposal or whatever we're running, right? These proposals are not like some weird arcane thing that we just made up at so-and-so high school for this tournament, right? These are real world proposals that are being you know, proposed right now and discussed right now. And many people are saying they are among the most plausible, likely things to happen, right? This is a real plausible thing. And if the term a practical solution, right, uh, is going to mean anything, it's got to mean that we can look at the way these issues are proposed to be solved in the real world, we can pick one of the leading ones. Maybe we can't go out and pick the most esoteric plan from some think tank, but if there are real proposals being proposed by these real world groups, we've got to be able to use those because PF is supposed to be about current events anyway, not sort of arcane stuff. And this is this is how it's happening in the real world, and we ought to be able to debate that. And I think there's a strong argument that you're, you should not get dinged for running a plan if you pick one of the major proposals out there in the world. And I think sort of like we said on the, um, the budget uh, resolution, Resolution about how you should be able to look to some of these real world proposals for how the budget gets balanced and say this is kind of sort of what it would look like. You should be able to do that here too. That's how PF is different from LD than policy. That's what makes it what it is. Okay. So let's assume you win that, right? You, you, you win that and you're able to say use the G4's proposal. All four G4 countries get in. Brazil, uh, Germany, uh, India and Japan, right? Well, but here's the problem. There's still some problems you have to contend with. Remember, I said this was going to get complex. This is kind of like a, a meta game, a, a chess game. There are still some problems you have to contend with. There's an additional layer of procedural complexity that, again, I just don't know that the topic committee wrangled with it. Because, for example, think about this. If you decide, okay, we're going to bring all four of the G4 members into the Security Council, and then you as the pro have a much more plausible case. You can say there are a lot of countries in the world that think this is legit and viable and and the, the members of the G4 will be happy, and there are many others who will be happy at this. Okay, you've got a more plausible offense, but now the con gets to use disadvantages not just from India getting in, but from Germany and Brazil, and most importantly from Japan. And there's abundant evidence out there, as we'll talk about later, that China is extremely concerned about Japan on the Security Council, and that this could create a major rift within the current P5 uh, on the Security Council. And you basically, what you're doing is you're exploding the topic out from a complex question about one country to a complex question now about at least four countries in a way that it's very, very difficult to cover in these little four and two minute speeches that you have, right? So more complicated than maybe we thought. But, but wait, wait, because it gets even more complicated, right? Because currently, all of these groups, right? The G4, the Anon group from 2005, everybody is at least floating the possibility that as a means of getting more countries on the Security Council, they might, or <coughs> excuse me, they, they maybe they even definitely would be willing to give up the idea of a veto. Because all these countries know that having, you know, 12 or 13 countries with a veto, with the ability to shut down the Security Council, would make it really difficult to get things done. They also know as a matter of practical politics that the United States and China and others and Russia are more likely to oppose their candidacy uh, if they have to have multiple vetoes.
So they've all in the real world proposed the idea that we would be willing to be permanent members. In other words, members who never leave, they don't have to get reelected, but without the veto, uh, the L69 and the African group, which is over 50 countries when you combine them, uh, they, you know, they want uh, permanent membership, but they also want to abolish the veto altogether, right? And all of these different permutations have different advantages for the pro and disads for the con. Like, so for example, if the G4 comes in, like all four of them come in, but then let's say they don't get vetoes, they, they abandon their vetoes, right? Well, then you might mitigate some of the harms of more vetoes, but then you might open up another attack from the con, which is now you're creating like second class citizenship and dividing the UN into even more tiers that, that makes it even more stratified than it was before. And those are different sets of advantages and disadvantages. And I guess what I'm saying is the decision calculus is very different depending on how you try to get India in. And you have to be cognizant of that. You have to be cognizant of variables like uh, how many uh, countries get in, which countries are they, do they keep the veto, and also potentially how many non-permanent members come in as part of the deal, because all of those things will vary up the decision calculus, right? And there's one last remaining sort of framework question, which is what about the veto? Let's talk about the veto in particular. Can the pro even legitimately run a case where we just add permanent members and some or all of them, they're permanent, they stay on, but some or all of them don't have the veto. And some people would say, again, no, that's a plan. And the pro would say what we said earlier, no, it's a practical solution. It's being talked about all over the place. This is what most experts in most countries are actually proposing. And I think the pro wins that. I think the pro has the ability to say, this is how the debate is working in the real world, right? Um, but there, the con certainly can make a counter argument. And I, I would if I were the con. I mean, I think the pro has the edge, but the con can certainly win this argument. And, and the argument would be, con would say okay maybe it's not a plan but it is extra topical and let me you may not use that term with the lay judge but let me explain what extra topical means if it's not something you've used before extra topicality is the idea that you as the pro or the af in a debate round can only advocate for what the resolution describes you can't like throw in other things for the judge to vote on through their fiat power uh, to increase your benefits or mitigate your, your harms through the judge's ballot. So, for example, if the resolution says we should cut personal income taxes, right, you can't run a case that says, yes, we'll cut personal income taxes, but we'll also raise corporate income taxes and use them on programs for the poor, because the resolution didn't say anything about those last two things. The scope of what the judge can make happen is limited by the resolution, and debate theory suggests that it is unfair and just illogical for the judge to think that they can make other things happen. So the argument would be this resolution talks about... Uh, India getting on as a permanent member, it says absolutely nothing about changing any other rules at the UN, right? And the con would say, look, um, this, you know, permanent membership has a real world meaning. Like you might even have a definition of permanent membership by like reading and quoting from the UN charter itself from 1945, because that's where the definition comes from. It's literally written right there in the UN charter that permanent membership entails having a veto over security council matters, right? And there's nothing in this resolution that says that we can change that. It, it doesn't say anything about it in the resolution. It doesn't let you sign your ballot and change it, right? So any advocacy that tells you that India won't have a veto is non-topical. Right, because in the current status quo, if you become a permanent member, permanent member, what that means is by definition you get a veto. Right. One important tip for the con on this, I think, is that the con needs to be very clear in crossfire about exactly what the pro is advocating for as the mechanism for India to get in the Security Council. Right. I think you need to ask exactly how is the UN Security Council status changing under your advocacy? Who is getting in? How many countries are getting in? How many total seats are there? What is the status of the veto? You have a right as a matter of fairness to know that because you could say to the judge, our defense, right, our con arguments are, are very widely depending on what the pro is going to say in terms of who gets in. They, they change dramatically. And if the pro won't answer that question, it's really not fair to us, right? They should have to answer that question because the way we defend uh, hinges greatly on exactly how they're advocating this. Again, which blows up the resolution to a level of complexity that I just don't think you ought to have in PF, but it is what it is. So that's the cons argument. Now, if I'm the pro, I probably want to avoid having to advocate for a veto, right? I, I want to... Now, there are certain types of cases where I might want to keep it. There are certain types of cases where I might want to say UN uh, India's veto on the UN Security Council would be good because it would help like check and prevent like other... Um, 
it would help prevent like the sort of military misadventures that many of these Western powers go on. But for most cases, like your generic run of the mill case, you're probably going to want to stay away from necessarily tying yourself to the veto. So how do you do that? Right? Well, there's a couple of options. The first option is to simply say, look, uh, we are just advocating for a, the, the most plausible real world way in which India could get on. And that is through one of these proposals and all of these proposals, the Anon group, the G4, all of these proposals involve some limitation on the veto. The other option you have as a pro, and I kind of like this one, is to just sort of embrace the vagueness of the resolution, right? Uh, about how India gets in. And under this approach, you would sort of basically kind of try to punt, like avoid all these other questions about the different permutations of how India gets in and just explain it this way. You'd say, look, judge, the pros advocacy is really simple here. Our opponents are trying to get all complex about like all these things about vetoes and other members and everything. They're trying to make this debate way too complicated. Our advocacy is very simple. There is a really strong argument and a strong consensus that the United Nations Security Council needs to be reformed and it needs to expand. And we're just saying that however it happens, India needs to be a part of it. You know, we are agnostic. We don't have a position on how many other countries should get in. Uh, we don't have a position on who they should be. We, we know who they probably will be, but we don't have to necessarily advocate for that because that's not what the resolution says. We don't have a position on the veto because we don't have to take a position on that. We don't have a position on, you know, a, a number of things like, you know, should we sign this on a Thursday or a Tuesday? Or, you know, who should pay the airfare for the diplomats to uh, arrive? And I mean, you know, we don't have positions on all the details. All we know is... The, the Security Council needs to be reformed through expansion, and we'll talk about that why in the in the pro arguments in a second, because, you know, legitimacy, right? And we know that India has a very, very strong case, and whatever happens, they should be a part of it. And, and that way, you can sort of check down out of any of the things. If they try to link you to the veto, you say, look, like we said earlier, Judge, we're not necessarily advocating for this veto. I know they keep telling you that this might happen, but that's not our advocacy. We're totally fine with the world where the veto, you know, uh, stays the same or doesn't stay the same. That's not our point, right? And the same thing with all these other countries. They say, well, Japan will do this. You know, Judge, we didn't say anything about Japan. We don't know what's going to happen with Japan. We're just here to talk about India. And especially with more like lay judges, I think this will fly really well. Uh, with some truly, truly flow judges, it might have a little bit of difficulty, some more experience like circuit style judges. But I think this idea of like, we're here to argue about one thing, whatever else happens is not our problem. It's not what we're advocating for. I think that has some validity to it. Okay, so now let's talk about some pro arguments. Um, before we do, I just wanted to pop this slide up there. I thought this was funny. This was from back in 2010. Uh, and they were talking about expanding the Security Council with some experts on foreign policy. And the question was, when will India get a permanent seat on the Security Council? This was in the Atlantic. And Daniel Dresner says, uh, it'll be right after the U.S. moves its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Well, guess what the U.S. just did in 2018? And there you have the picture uh, with Ivanka Trump. Uh, moving the embassy uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, so, hey, maybe maybe now the time is right. Maybe you pro when you're on the pro, you should feel like you have momentum. It's sort of like saying, you know, when will this happen? When pigs fly, right? And the pig flies like right over your head. So I just thought that was kind of funny as I was doing the research on this, that uh, that was the prediction. Anyway, I, I have three arguments I want to talk about on the pro. Uh, there are others out there. There are a lot of different permutations. This is international relations, you know, kind of like with the Law of the Sea Treaty. There's a lot of different directions you can go. But I am a big believer in having sort of one like main sort of fortress argument in the middle and then maybe having a couple of more esoteric ones. So I want to start with what I consider like my main fortress argument on this resolution, and that is the United Nations Security Council must expand in order to be legitimate. And India is the best candidate to make that happen, right? This is the foundation of the entire case if I'm running it. And honestly, if I, uh, my, the debaters at my wife's uh, school where she coaches are not debating this month. They have the month off until May. So they're not doing this. But if they were, I would tell them this needs to be like, if, you guys, if you happen to be watching this, you're probably not. I would have told them this is what you need to do is your sort of main argument. And then you can have some options for your remaining ones. Uh, and, and by the way, I want to say I'm a big fan of this general format for cases, which is take the meat of your case, take the fortress that you want to sort of fight and die in if you have to, where you want to make your last stand if you have to, and put that in the first contention, right? And, and only in the first contention and put enough evidence that it's all there that you cover the bases and then you can expand out with additional evidence later. But don't spend all three contentions making one sort of fortress case. Put that fortress, that core meat of the case in one contention with good solid evidence, not too much of it, have additional backup evidence to expand ready to go. 
But then what that does is it frees up your latter two contentions, two and three, or however you want to structure it, to try something very different and more esoteric. And you can go off in a completely different direction with those last two, knowing that the first one is ready to go and you're ready to fight on it as needed, right? Uh, this is a form of sort of spreading the field. I don't mean spreading like talking fast. I mean spreading out your arguments ideologically so they can't be grouped together. If contentions one, two, and three are all part of the same logical syllogism, it's like step one in the syllogism, step two in the syllogism, step three in the syllogism, you're opening yourself up to having your entire case be attacked very efficiently by your opponents. Whereas if you pack the, the strongest argument into one and then go in a completely different direction for two and three, as long as they're logically consistent, you're giving them a lot more things to cover. And you can do that without having to read fast as long as you're judicious about how much evidence you pack into the initial case, as long as you get the core essential warrants in there. And then if you need additional warrants to back them up, you have those ready to go, but it lets you fit a lot more ideas into that first four minute speech. Anyway, here's how this core fortress argument goes. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to set up what we call the inherent Inherency. Remember, the inherency is not a term we use in the round, but it's the idea that there's something wrong with the status quo, right? The Security Council defends almost entirely on being viewed as legitimate. That's its main resource. It has no army. It has no economy, right? The only way it gets people to act is through legitimacy. That's what the UK and France didn't have in the League of Nations in the 1930s, right? And currently, there's empirical data that it's not viewed as legitimate, which we'll talk about in a minute. In order to change that view as being not legitimate, of having this deficit of the resource that it direly needs, it needs to add more permanent members, and India is by far the best candidate to do that. So let's break that out and talk about how that argument runs. Right, You start by explaining briefly why legitimacy and representativeness are essential in international organizations. Without the perception of legitimacy and representation, the Security Council and the UN generally are literally nothing. They're pieces of paper. Again, they have no army, they have no economy, there's nothing they can do without getting their members to buy in and go along like the UK and France could couldn't do in the 1930s, right? In some cases, states may walk away, or they might just become apathetic and stop supporting the organization, stop going along with its resolutions, right? And so we have this very good article from Matthew Stephen in 2018 that very succinctly in like debate card friendly format explains why legitimacy is key and why these voluntary international organizations are basically worthless without it. And you explain, look, right now, the UN Security Council is not viewed as legitimate because it's basically a relic from 1945 with the winners of World War II. It does not reflect the current geopolitical balance of power. It's not diverse. It's not diverse racially. It's not diverse really all that diverse geographically. It's not diverse in terms of religion of, of the inhabitants of these countries. It doesn't reflect the modern world. And, but here's the great part. You don't have to take our word for it, Judge. You don't have to just take common sense that it's not viewed as legitimate because there is actually, and honestly, I could not believe it when I found this, but there is actually a very good numeric data-driven study of the UN that shows just how illegitimately the Security Council is viewed among UN member states. And this is going to be the Bender and Hypel study. I think it's Hypel. It might be Hubel. I just know people who have that name and pronounce it Hypel. But this is the Bender and Hypel 2015 study which is, of course, going to be linked in the notes below and you need to read it. But these are two social scientists who are reviewing statements during actual UN debates, like actual uh, over 1,500 of them, right? And anytime a delegate says something good or bad or indifferent about the legitimacy of the Security Council, they cataloged it and they classified it as pro or con on legitimacy and they and why they thought it was legitimate or illegitimate. And you really need to read it to understand how good this evidence is. But the money quote is this one here, where they say they've analyzed 1,500 statements about the Security Council's legitimacy from UN members and 73% viewed it as illegitimate. 73% were negative on its legitimacy. That's a ridiculously high number of illegitimate votes compared to only 23% viewing it as a legitimate body that truly represented their interest. And when you break it down further, you actually see here that the reason behind this overwhelming lack of legitimacy is four things, transparency, participation, accountability, and great power dominance. This is on page 245 of the article. And all of these, all of these are related directly to the idea that we have a small number of elite countries just kind of running the show, right? Obviously, participation in great power dominance, that clearly is related to having five great powers running the show, but also accountability and transparency, because how can the Security Council be accountable or transparent to these? non-traditional powers if none of them truly have a seat at the table, if none of them um, are in the room where it happens, to quote uh, Aaron Burr from, from Hamilton. And so, you know, and by the way, in this article, in the Bender and Heupel article, in addition to the stats, there are tons of great quotes that you can mine explaining why the Security Council has a legitimacy deficit. 
And there are absolutely other quotes out there that are less clinical and more powerful about just like why it's such a relic and you can throw one of those in too. But you should have plenty of ammunition to say, look, it's just a matter of math. People think this thing's a joke. And then you explain why. If they think it's a joke, then it's literally nothing because all it has is its legitimacy and its ability to marshal support from people, right? Okay, so now we have this like rock solid explanation. Legitimacy is what makes the world go round when it comes to the Security Council. It is the fuel that makes the rocket ship go, right? Because it has no army, it has no economy, right? Uh, and it's got a shortage of legitimacy that we can show as a matter of math, right? And it was because a huge part of the world feels left out. So we need a more inclusive council. And while there's lots of countries that might be considered, and maybe we should take multiple ones, we don't know, the best one is India, right? Uh, and, and this is where you just sort of drop your sort of carpet bomb of all the reasons why India is good. But we'll get to that in just a second. You can also point to more direct numbers that show a direct consensus on the security count, not, excuse me, in the UN that, uh, that India needs to get in, right? There, there are a lot of countries that you can point to that already have said they want India to get in. The G4 is in favor. The L69 is 42 developing countries. They're in favor. The African group is 54 countries. They're in favor, although some of them do overlap with the L69. So, but it's still high double digits. Uh, the US, UK, and France have all said they're open to India joining, right? Over 90 countries, if you just look at the Wikipedia page about India's accession to the Security Council, they're all in favor of India joining. So we have a large number of countries that have already said they think this is a good idea. Uh, you only have about 12, the members of the UFC, who have actually said on the record that they think it's a bad idea, right? And they just think it's a bad idea to have more uh, uh, permanent members in general. They actually don't necessarily have any specific opposition to India. So the overwhelming number of countries that have sort of stated their position have said India should get in. And this is important because this is not just like one of those things that's kind of a throwaway contention, like we should raise taxes because 70% of Americans want to raise taxes. If legitimacy is the thing we're seeking, then the fact that 90 countries or whatever support it and have said they support it you don't need to go farther you don't need to even then ask is it a good idea the whole point is to make them happy the whole point is to make them feel that it's legitimate if they're telling you that they think it's legitimate then india should be on and that's it right that's that's the argument um and, and now this is the part where you just start bombarding the judge with the with india's resume with its qualifications a bunch of stats about their economy 3.1 trillion dollars their massive population their military spending their nuclear status the fact that they're the world's largest democracy the fact that they're the largest supplier of peacekeeping troops, all of those things. The fact that India tends to be highly respected at the UN. You can throw in whatever you want. And this is where you just kind of machine gun these things in very quickly, as fast as you can, and just impress the judge with, you know, how great India is, right? And a very simple way of sort of putting this to kind of boil it down, and maybe this is just kind of a statement you use in rebuttal, is look, even laying aside all of India's great qualifications, the fact that it has this huge economy, that it can wield against bad actors, that it has a nuclear arsenal, that it has you know, a, a significant military, even laying them aside. If you move India onto the Security Council, then you immediately move 1.3 billion people or 20% of the world's entire population from the UN Security Council is a joke camp to the UN Security Council is pretty good camp. That alone is moving 20% of the world's population from anti to pro UN Security Council. That by itself ought to be reason enough for us to be thinking about moving them onto the council, right? It's not trivial at all. So that's the basic con foundation contention. That's the fortress we build. And then we can try a couple of others and we'll talk about them. I do have one caveat though, on this contention and on the pro case as a whole, which is that you need to be focusing on India, excuse me, focusing on the world as a whole, not on India, right? Uh, it, it, there are a lot of people out there who talk about like benefits for India, like getting more aid, getting more trade, getting more economic development if they're on the Security Council. And that's all well and good, except for the fact that it's a zero sum game. More aid for India from like the IMF or from any other group, right, is going to mean less aid to another country. And any decent con is just going to say, well, okay, fine. India gets more aid, but a needy country down the road that is at least as impoverished as India is going to get less. It's a zero sum game. So I would focus heavily on the pro on and on both sides on the benefits to the whole world as opposed to the benefits uh, to India, right? Now, a couple of more contentions that you can have in addition to this core one. Another one is India would be on the Security Council a, vo a voice for the marginalized, right? One possible knock on India is despite the fact that it has a large overall economy, its per capita GDP is pretty poor uh, uh, on average, uh, economically poor, obviously. And by the way, 
be careful on both sides, on the pro, if you're knocking any particular country. Remember, as always, to be very sensitive to the fact you're talking about human beings and their lives. You may very well have people whose background, you know, whose ancestors, who they themselves may be from India. You never, there are a significant number of Indian American debaters, obviously, in the debate community. Be very careful, but regardless, be very careful in any time you're talking about any people group. But it is an economically impoverished country compared to many others on the Security Council. But there's a nifty way to turn this to your advantage, right? By I pointed to the fact that India has for a long time spoken out against what it calls the anachronism of having a few wealthy, mostly white, mostly European countries working, uh, running the show, right? And the idea, and there's this very good block quote from Manish Debade, I think that's how you say the name, in 2017 that points out that India has been fighting for regional representation for uh, developing countries, not just for itself, for decades. And as part of the G4, India has already signed on to the idea of expanding the council uh, to 20 or 25 seats. So the argument would be, if India becomes a permanent member, it's going to be a, a strong voice for the global poor and for more diverse representation. It's going to be sort of like the tip of the spear. You put India in there and India is going to be inside the Security Council. It's going to have a seat at the table. It's going to be a voice for more representation for more countries in the global poor. And if you have to expand at once, great. But if not, even if you just put India on by itself, that would be good because India is going to get in there and fight for everybody else who's not been represented in the past. And that sort of refutes the idea that India is poor. You turn that argument and say, what are you talking about, you elitists? I mean, they pull their own weight. They have a, a big economy. They have nuclear arsenal. Um, they are, and they're going to, and, and number two, you turn the idea that letting India in alone is bad. And you can say, we're not necessarily for letting India in alone, but if you did let India in alone, right, if they were the only ones you let in, they would be a great voice for uh, representation for uh, for sort of marginalized countries or less represented countries. So even if that were the only option, you would be more likely to see them get in later with India as a member than without mem India as a member. And so that would be a good thing. The last type of contention I'm going to talk about, and there are a lot of options, uh, is the idea that India will check Western military, uh, like colonialist uh, military misadventures, right? There's a lot of good evidence on this out there, and we will link to some of the notes about how India takes a very skeptical approach to this international event, uh, intervention to like topple dictators and impose democracy around the world, right? Uh, and in many historical instances, the United Nations Security Council has basically been used to give cover to Western countries, most notably the United States, to go on these sort of you know military adventures, these military invasions around the world. For example, we approved a resolution uh, 1441 back in 2002 where the UNSC... Um, approved uh, the use of force against Saddam Hussein and that in, in Iraq. And that was, you know, in the long run, I think pretty clearly a debacle. I mean, it turned Iraq into a country that was ripe for takeover from, from ISIS. And as bad as uh, Saddam Hussein was, ISIS is worse. It cost many, many thousands of lives and billions of dollars. Uh, and, and India, there's a lot of evidence, like, for example, from, from this guy, Dan Krauss at the Institute for International Politics, who point out India is very skeptical about these things. So if you're worried about the United States basically using the United Nations Security Council as kind of its cover, its legitimizer for going out and going and, and having another Iraq or having another Afghanistan and things that, that don't end up well, having another Libya. Um, the India is going to is going to push back on these things. Okay, so let's do some con arguments now. Uh, when I first started out researching this and some of the other folks helping me out, um, I was a little worried. I thought, boy, India sure has a strong resume, and I was wondering what the con was going to say. But the more I read, the more I realize that the con really does have some strong, balanced arguments here. Uh, the core argument I'm going to try to run if I'm the con is probably I'm going to try to hold the pro to having to advocate for the expansion of vetoes. And I'm basically going to say that adding one or more new vetoes to the Security Council is going to further paralyze an already paralyzed UN Security Council. So um, basically, how do we know, you know, how do we know that the UN Security Council is already paralyzed? I'm glad you asked. Because just like there was a really neat piece of evidence on the pro, there's a really neat one on the con. The UN literally issued a press release in January 2019 saying the Security Council is paralyzed. And it's largely because of the permanent members and their veto power. Uh, this is from January 2019, published by the United Nations itself. And it is this fantastic point-by-point, uh, point, like meeting-by-meeting summary 
of 2018 and it basically says this is us the UN telling you that our security council is, is paralyzed and it's the it's the permanent five members that are doing it and their veto is often how they're doing it not always but in many cases you, you don't get much better than that it's the organization itself it's super recent compared to most literature on the topic and it basically gives you this incredibly nice rundown of exactly how bad things have been over the last year right now you don't have to read this whole thing uh, you can definitely pull some some nice cards out of it by just skimming. But boy, if you did, you'd be in a better position. The more you read and the more you know, the more details you can marshal, the more you can impress people. It's always better in PF. So, and then basically you say, okay, look, it's paralyzed. The UN is telling you it's paralyzed because we have these permanent members and, and because we have these vetoes. And you say, look, adding more vetoes would be bad, right? Uh, adding one veto would be bad. But alternatively, if your opponent is running the entire G4 getting in or the G4 plus two or the Kofi Annan plan, how However, this is why you want to ask them, how many members are we getting, right? And you hold them to the idea that they cannot change the veto. There's nothing in the resolution that lets them change the veto here, right? If you hold them to that and you say, look, this is how many vetoes you're going to be adding. You say, look, if we're paralyzed with five, how much more paralyzed are we going to be with six? Or God forbid, if they run a bunch of them with nine or 11. And this is the paradox of like representation versus effectiveness, right? The more representative and the more deliberative a body gets, the less able it is to act particularly if you're giving some of the members the unilateral ability to shut the whole thing down, which is what permanent membership currently means, right? Um, you could also take some of these arguments that we mentioned on the pro side about how India is skeptical about international involvement and turn those around. Instead of saying India is going to stop us when we do something bad, like when we have the next Iraq, you could say they're going to stop us from doing something important and good, like stopping the next genocide, right? There is this uh, piece from Hena Makija. I hope I said that right, I probably did not, in 2017, and she explains that India has strongly and consistently this is as part of its sort of general skepticism right about um, international intervention one of the things it's done is it's opposed what's called pillar three of the responsibility to protect uh, and this is a 2005 document or uh, it, I actually it started in 2001 but it's an idea from the International Commission on the intervention and state on intervention and state sovereignty and it basically says that among other things the international community has a responsibility to intervene and stop genocide and ethnic cleansing right atrocities like that and 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 india has said we're not on board with that we're not on board with the idea that the international community needs to intervene in the rwandas of the world to stop genocide and it might be that part of the reason i think part of the reason is their reluctance is because it might come back to bite them on the cashmere conflict uh, which we'll talk about in a few minutes which you know has involved uh, uh, some allegations of very serious potential war crimes. But regardless regardless of why it is the case, India has made it clear we're not in favor of intervening to stop genocide, which is what Pillar 3 of the R2P agreement is about, right? Responsibility to protect. So that's a nice, simple impact where you say, look, you bring India on and, you, you know, the, the, the UN... A security council might be paralyzed now, but it's going to get even worse. And the specific impact judge is going to be they're never, ever going to be reliable on stopping genocide. And, you know, judge, you may think that sometimes we've messed up and we've gone in the wrong time. But don't you think we should at least have the option, the plausible option as the security council of taking action to stop genocide? Even if you think we've done it wrong in the past, don't you think we should keep that on the table? And if we bring India on with their stated opposition to the responsibility to protect, they're going to veto most, if not all, of these attempts we have to stop genocide, and that's a bad thing. That's the worst impact you can possibly have, right? Next contention would be the idea of the political trade-offs of getting India in as a permanent member, and this goes back to the question of how you're going to do it, right? Um, the G4's position is that all four of their members should get in, right? Other groups, like the African group, think multiple groups should get in. And the basic idea here is that, as a practical matter, you just basically cite these different proposals and you just point out that there's there's nobody proposing India gets in alone, that there are going to be political trade-offs. These, these countries have gotten together and they've worked together because they know they need to push forward as a united front. That's the politics of it. So for India to get in, India is going to have to support, and the judge effectively is going to have to vote for, or the real world proposals, right? The idea that, um, the, you know, the, the idea that if, if India gets in, then probably almost, almost, well, overwhelmingly likely that Brazil, 
uh, Japan and Germany also are going to get in because that's what they've been proposing for years. And then what you do is you link from that and say, okay, so that means that I, as I said earlier, I can now point to not only the harms of India, but also the harms of others, these other countries getting in. And the biggest one is Japan, right? By far the best example would be to say, if India gets in as a practical matter, then Japan also gets in, right? Because they're part of this group who are like birds of a feather, right? China has made it very clear that it opposes Japan. You know the history between them, right? You know Japan's in bloody you know, violent, genocidal, almost invasion of China uh, back before World War II. And it's very easy to say that Japan on the Security Council is going to make China really, really mad, right? And the argument would be if the point of this is to improve the legitimacy and improve the the, the, the sort of hold together status of the uh, Security Council, well, angering the second greatest power in the world, maybe arguably the greatest power in the world, is a really, really bad way to do that. So, so that's sort of number one. The, there's sort of two impacts. One is this is just bad for the cohesiveness of the Security Council. And the second argument is you could try to make an argument that this is going to lead to some kind of like specific you know, sort of like nuclear level conflict, you know, uh, you could do this with sort of the Kashmir and Pakistan arguments as well. I, I really don't think if it were me, I would try to make a run for those sort of long reaching, you know, impacts where you have to jump from several cards to say it's going to lead to nuclear war, because there's a common sense argument against any like major regional nuclear war argument, which is that basically since the UN was created, like since the creation of the international order after World War II, no two major powers have gone to war against each other, certainly not nuclear war. And we have seen things that are way bigger than Japan or India getting on the Security Council, way bigger than anything having to do with Kashmir or anything like that, and we've gotten through them. The U.S. and the Soviet Union were locked in a nuclear stare down for years. There was the Cuban Missile Crisis. Russia hacked the U.S. election recently. Russia has invaded Crimea. China steals U.S. intellectual property. The US U.S. and everybody else have challenged China's claim to the South China Sea. China's insane client state in North Korea has threatened everybody with nuclear weapons. All these things happen again and again and again, and nobody ever goes to war, right? Nobody ever goes to war, and certainly nobody goes to nuclear war, because they all know that there's too much at stake, right? There's too much at stake, lose everything economically, have billions of lives lost, potentially, especially if it's a nuclear exchange, if it's a nuclear exchange right? They all know that, right? So, you know, in, in, in policy, it's a little difficult to do that, but in PF, you ought to be able to look a judge in the eye and say, look, if we got through, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Cold War and Russia hacking our own elections and years and years of India and Pakistan being at each other's throats with nuclear weapons, the idea of moving somebody to a new diplomatic position, as important as it may be, is not going to lead to a massive war because great powers don't go to war anymore. And you, I think you just need to sort of have that as a tool in your repertoire when people try to link to this. You can try, you can try, but I think the main impact is it just, look, if we're doing a security council, we want to do it right. We want to make sure that all the major powers are on board and hacking off China is a really bad idea if we want a cohesive security council that's willing to move together in lockstep. Uh, in addition, also, this is a related argument on China. You don't necessarily have to use the link of like, okay, if India gets on, then Japan gets on, and Japan makes in, uh, China mad. You could just say directly that maybe China is directly nervous about India. In other words, it doesn't matter whether we do Japan. We don't have to do that extra step. Uh, there are a lot of folks out there saying, yep, yeah, China is, is going to be upset if we bring India on board as a permanent member. I am skeptical about this because... I, I don't think this is as big a deal breaker to China as a lot of people are saying, and I think there's some evidence about that. Like, look to the Economic Times in July 2018, which tells us that China's statements about security expansion, Security Council expansion are, quote, ambivalent. The exact quote, the most recent quote from China's foreign ministry about expanding the Security Council is, quote, China supports the UN Security Council reform so as to enhance its authority and effectiveness. I mean, that doesn't say yes or no. That's just very vague. So while China won't explicitly endorse India, they know India is a candidate and they've never said anything against India. Plus, these two countries, India and China, have like $80 billion a year in trade. They're huge trading partners. China's leadership is so obsessed with trade because they know that trade and growth are essential to them staying in power and remaining legitimate, right? So it just seems very unlikely. And the other thing about it is if China really was worried about India, they know how to say so, right? They are not the type to sort of sit on the sideline and sit on their hands and, and not say anything if they are, you know, if they're worried about something internationally. Um, they, they know how to tell the international community to 
go jump in a lake, right? Remember on the Unclause video we did at the beginning of the year, we told you how China basically told uh, an international tribunal that, that they didn't care what they said about the, the islands in the South China Sea. They weren't going to follow their ruling. And similarly here, if, if they were worried about India getting on and just absolutely did not want India on and were willing to walk away or go to war or whatever, they would be telling us that. And, and, and the best piece of evidence, though, is this is also uh, from the Economic Times. Uh, this is from last year. Um, is there's this editorial uh, in China's state-run media. And remember, their media is not like our media in the United States. State-run media in China is basically sort of the side door by which the government says what it really thinks. When you read an editorial in many of these newspapers, it's essentially the position of the Chinese government sort of being disguised as an editorial. And the editorial basically says, you know, India, your problem is that you're hanging out with Japan. Right? They basically tell India, we don't necessarily have a problem with you, but when you go palling around with Japan on the Security Council stuff, that's what we have a problem with. Right, So the idea that India by itself is going to anger China, China hasn't said that. If they meant that, they know how to say it. They've kind of hinted through this state-run media stuff that they don't really care so much about India. It's Japan that they're worried about. So I just don't think... Um, you know, I, I just don't think that's the case. And if and the question I would have for any if pro team that's running a China hates India kind of argument is, if China's so freaked out about this, can you read me a single quote ever in the history of the world where China said, we're opposed to adding India as a permanent member? Have they ever said that? They, they state their opposition to all kinds of other things very clearly, but have they ever done that here? And the answer is no. And then, of course, the last thing we want to talk about is probably the big one in terms of, you know, what a lot of people are talking about, which is Kashmir. Now, we don't have time to go over the entire history of the Kashmir conflict between India and Pakistan. It's incredibly long. For purposes of a con argument and PF debate, it goes like this. Kashmir is a long-running conflict in which India has uh, arguably, and I think there's a strong consensus, disregarded international human rights law. Kashmir, of course, is a region on the border between Pakistan and India. It has ignored the recommendations of uh, directives of the UN itself. And basically, you know, after the partition of India, there was this dispute over whether the predominantly Muslim Kashmir region would join India or Pakistan. And after some fighting, the UN got involved. And this was back in the late 1940s, early 1950s, and it established a commission and it told India and Pakistan that they needed to conduct a plebiscite, a vote, to let the Kashmiri people decide who they wanted to join, India or Pakistan. But that vote never happened, right? And India effectively went in and asserted dominion over Kashmir, never had the vote. And over the years, there have been many, 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 many examples of conflicts and violence and deaths and destruction and rebellions in the Kashmir region, continuing even to this day, even into 2019. In many ways, it's much like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, just this ongoing bloody kind of low-level rebellion because one group of people, one nation is asserting control over an area where the people don't feel like they're part of that nation, right? In the 1950s, India's prime minister even promised to hold this plebiscite, but they never did, right? And, and look, let's be super clear here. There are two sides to this story. Nobody's blaming India alone for what's going on in Kashmir. There's violence on both sides. But there's also very credible evidence that Indian forces have engaged in violence and human rights violations against Kashmiri civilians, according to a 2018 report by the UN High Commission on Human Rights. We're talking about killing of protesters, 150 in one case, and in other cases, it gets a lot worse. Like there's discussion, for example, of mass graves and things like that, right? So there's two basic impacts that you can draw from this about why Kashmir means that India is not ready to join the Security Council. The first is just generally because uh, because of Kashmir, India lacks the legitimacy to join the P5, right? It would actually harm the Security Council's perceived legitimacy. It doesn't matter who's right or wrong in the Kashmir conflict. What matters is that India was instructed by the UN back in the late 1940s to come up with a fair solution. And the fair solution was a plebiscite, letting the Kashmiris vote. And it didn't do it. And to this day, because it didn't do it, right, they probably would have voted to join Pakistan, right? There is ongoing violence and Indian troops and Indian security forces are engaging in it in many kinds of cases. And keep in mind, this is an ongoing conflict, not between two sort of random tiny countries out there, but between two nuclear, two of like the 11 nuclear powers in the world. And if India can't be trusted to resolve this dispute fairly and can't be trusted to do 
what the UN asked it to do, which is to have this vote, right, and to let these folks decide, how in the world can we elevate them to this exalted position where they become one of the guardians of global security, where they can basically tell the UN to jump in a lake on anything, certainly on Kashmir, but really on anything it wants to, right? So what you could say is maybe if they can reach a resolution on Kashmir, maybe then they'll have the legitimacy to join, but they don't right now. And I think the practical tagline on this is, here's what you say if you're the con. You say, so wait, let me get this straight. You want to promote world peace by picking one side in a nuclear standoff, right? The one that many experts actually believe is the most likely to trigger a real nuclear war, as unlikely as those are. This would be the one that might be the most likely to trigger a real nuclear war, right? And we're going to take that one side in that dispute, and we're going to add them to the global police force, and we're going to tell the other to go take a hike. That's how we're going to promote global peace. Okay. I mean, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So that's the general impact of India hasn't handled this right. There's ongoing violence, and we'll you know link to some of the impacts on the specific levels of deaths and things like that. But they're just not legitimate as a result. The second is actually more specific and direct, and this is this is my lawyer background kicking in. Permanent membership would ensure that Indian officials could never face justice for atrocities committed in Kashmir. Right? Again, acknowledging there are two sides, acknowledging that you know folks on the other side have done bad things too, but let's just hear out the argument. If you look uh, at this piece by Garima Tiwari, I believe, it explains this. It says India has opposed the creation of the International Criminal Court, and it has not ratified the Rome Statute by which a company, excuse me, a country can actually accept jurisdiction and submit itself to potentially having its officials come before the court. And the ICC, the International Criminal Court, is, is basically a court where, among other things, leaders of countries can be held accountable for atrocities and human rights violations and genocide. And the article of points to the existence of mass graves in Kashmir, uh, which the Indian government would understandably like to avoid being hauled into court over, right? So what does all this have to do? You're saying, Brett, what does this have to do with, with permanent membership on the Security Council? I'm glad you asked. Because if you don't ratify the Rome Statute, right? The Rome Statute says we're willing to go before the International Criminal Court. We'll do it if we are accused of something. Well, India opposed it vehemently and did not ratify it. But the only other way you can ever actually be hauled before the ICC is if the UN Security Council refers your case there. And if you are a permanent member of the UN Security Council, guess what you can do? You can veto that. Or at minimum, you can vote against it and pressure and lobby for you to never have to go before the ICC. So... The only way that India could ever be held accountable for violations in Kashmir is if the Security Council sent them there. Now, that's not likely. It's not imminent. But basically what you would be doing is prohibiting any possible review ever in the future of any atrocities in the Kashmir conflict because India would be able to effectively veto any attempt to send it before the ICC. Sort of like how the United States could veto sending, you know, people who said George Bush is a war criminal. I'm not taking a position on that. But people who said that said that we're on the Security Council and therefore he will never face justice because we would, we would veto it, right? That's the idea. Uh, so that's a pretty interesting little wrinkle, pretty interesting little nuance. So those are the basic con arguments. It's kind of complicated. Uh, as I said, it's a sort of deceptively kind of tricky uh, conceptual topic, but I do think there are some straightforward, simple kind of fortress arguments that you can do. And so with that, let's move on and quickly do some final thoughts. Okay, so final thoughts really quickly. I think on this resolution, the takeaway is you need to understand the possibility that things should be could be complex. And there could be a lot of different ways that you could see people running their offense on this. My recommendation, though, is for you to be prepared for those, to have blocks and responses for all of those potential things, but to keep your advocacy simple and straightforward. Tell a simple story. When you are on the pro, tell a simple story about how, you know, for example, we don't really care about all these peripheral issues. All we know is that the UN Security Council has to have legitimacy. It has to be viewed as legitimate to work. Currently, it has a legitimacy deficit, and the only way to fix that is to get more representative countries on there. And if you had to pick one, that one would be India. It is far and away the most qualified. Keep that narrative super simple, right? And very similarly, when you're on the con, the idea is nobody deserves a veto. A veto is the ability to shut things down, right? We don't want to add vetoes. It's a bad idea. Maybe hypothetically, what we would want to do is to consider fundamentally restructuring the Security Council, but until that happens, we don't want to make a bad problem worse by having more vetoes and we certainly don't want to do it with a country that has 
is going to bring on uh, Japan, you know, that is going to freak China out. And we certainly don't want to do it with a country that has the human rights issues uh, that we see in the Kashmir conflict with a nuclear rival. That's a really, really uniquely bad idea. Keep your narrative simple. Uh, keep it straightforward. April is going to be a, a competitive month. Obviously, the folks that are still debating at this point are pretty good. Uh, so best of luck to you. We will be back uh, next time and be back for the NSDA topic as well. Uh, but until then, remember, debate's supposed to be fun, even on complex topics like this. So work hard, have fun, and hail state.